Listener Production. I'm automotive commentator and journalist Greg Rust, and this is Rusty's Garage. I've come to realise with this podcast that lots of people in racing and automotive have good stories. It's not just about the headline makers. My guest for this episode is proof of that in so many ways and he's got some ripper yarns which he tells so well. People in Australia and New Zealand will know Owen Kelly from his drives in supercars, particularly the Enduros, and more recently at the wheel of a Trans Am where he's a race winner and finished second in the title chase in 2022. What you may not know is that Owen has a deep love of NASCAR and its history. He knows the people and many of them take his calls. That appreciation for the sport, together with an almost unrelenting persistence saw him break into the club, one of a handful of Aussies to get a start. He went wheel to wheel with some big guns, as you'll hear, snuck a drive of the car raced by one of the all-time greats. He drove for a famous name and lived at his place for a time too. Even did some qualifying for his mate Marcus Ambrose when the schedule between Cup and what we now called the Xfinity Series, or Second Tier, was a crazy juggle for Marcus. Because it's the motorsport off-season, we have given you an extended listen here. Three parts to enjoy over the holiday break at your leisure. There is everything from early days in supercars, a massive crash that he rarely opens up on, and how it was seconds away from ending up brown bread, as Owen would say. Buying Brock's car getting Mark Scaife's help with a sponsorship proposal, the influence of Speedway, a driver that Days of Thunder based one of its characters round that he is still a big fan of to this day and much more. We decided, actually didn't take much arm twisting, to do this chat out the back of the Exchange Hotel in Port Melbourne over a couple of amber lemonades. We begin by chatting about early life in Tasmania, the conversations this cheeky kid had with his mum and dad around things like nicknames for friends and colleagues in the transport business that he now works in with family. Motorsport was never far from his mind and the cogs began ticking over at age four on how he was going to stitch it all together. I think he loved... Because your dad's had a great history in transport and things. You had a love for Bedford tray trucks back then. Yeah, Is yeah, that right? Yeah. And you you really workshopped with him about how you could earn enough money to do what you wanted to do in life, whatever that, that may have been. That's... Deep yeah. conversation for a four-year-old. Yeah, it is. <laughs> well, you've got to plan early, don't you? So. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that, that was the case. And um, uh, I couldn't... I remember... I don't, I don't remember that four-year-old conversation, conversation but i do remember um you know trying to figure out uh trying to get your head around how how you are going to make enough dough to to go and do anything you know is is the correct if i'm right here is is the the real motorsport um thinking if you like when joe sullivan came to stay you would have been about six he worked i think for murray carter um, at the time, and he would come down, stay with you guys, wait for the truck to arrive on the on the boat, and you talk to him about being a racing driver. Yeah, that's right. And um, how how am I going to get there? And how do you do it? And uh, all the, and yeah, no, Joe was great, and um, I do remember that from way back then. And it was um, it was always a special time of year because the touring car championship come to town, and Joe would come and stay and. Yeah. Um, you know, catch up with him on on what had been happening, and and then in later later years, he's he was still coming to stay, but he was working for, you know, Glenn Seaton so, and people yeah. like that, and yeah. um, uh, and Joe's still there today. Amazing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, a real a real feature of the of the paddock, good fella. Yeah. Um, rookie cart, age eight. Your brother Christian tells me you seized a Victor engine 
at one point, and your words your words were, but I only gave it two turns. Two, two tunes. <laughs> two, two tunes, tunes. sorry, two yeah, tunes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, used, to, used to have to tune those things quite a bit to get them just right. And, uh, yes, yeah, so I only gave it two tunes, and the thing seized up. <laughs> I blamed the engine builder. <laughs> Did you? Your dad, uh, yeah. your dad reckons 35 bucks probably would have fixed it, and it was nothing compared to, because he was doing Speedway at the time, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, you know, right. the, yeah. the, the engines in those things. Yeah. His... his Speedway racing must have had a profound effect on you, did it, mate? I mean, it, it yeah, it was because um, I don't remember. You know, when people say I was born into it, and I guess it's what what it is because I don't remember there ever not being a race car in the garage, and because there was one well, yeah. since I was born. And what were they? What cars? Can you remember? Um, uh, like what you'd call a dirt late model now, mm. what they called Grand Nationals um, back then, and and yeah. the like, and. So, you know, um, obviously V8s, methanol, and it was the way our house was built, our bedrooms were above the garage. Fantastic. And there was a set of stairs come up the back of the garage into a, a doorway halfway along the corridor, basically right outside my bedroom door. And um, mum was always blowing up because the methanol fumes are coming up <laughs> in there and she's trying to get the kids to bed and go to sleep and there's this V8 engine running downstairs and, and so on. So... Um, so yeah, you'd, uh, I don't think I had much chance of avoiding motorsport. You were around it with him at a very young age, going to the races. I mean, you're doing yeah. this now with your son Hudson in many yeah, ways. Yeah. So same same thing. No, hundred percent. We went to all the races and um, uh, as as much as we could. And I think you know that we were getting carted around to the races when we were babies as well. You know, and um, obviously um, speed. Well, all, you know, all motor racing is a family sport, but particularly speedway Way, yeah. and. Um, so uh, yeah, just you know, my early they're my earliest memories being at the speedway. Mm. I, I have vivid recollections, mate, of Liverpool Speedway in Sydney and going there with my folks. I'm a, I'm a little bit older than you, but I can always remember the gate from the the pit or the paddock would would open. It was like a, like a big barn gate. It would swing right open. And I gather from your dad, they kind of had to, to line it up from the back of the thing to enter the bowl. You had, you had to do it like at like an angle and then drop it into the into the bowl. And I can still remember his, it was Ansett, wasn't it? It was Ansett yeah, backing yeah. On, on his car when it, yep. when it came into the, and was it, it, I mean, the number you run in Trans Am now is 73. He was 73. Mm. Is yeah, that right? That's, that's dad's number, so. What's the connection? Yeah. What's the, what's um, the reasoning? I, I don't think, uh, when he ended up with, well, how he got the number, um, I actually need him to tell me again. He did mm. tell me once. It wasn't anything um, super significant. No, or, and mm. and, uh, um, and he, once he got that number, he stuck with it, and yep. that's what we just grew up with. And then that style of number, the way he ran it for forever, was um, you know became synonymous with him, mm. and that's what everybody knew him as was that orange seventy three. Yeah. Um, then he you know went on to the sprint car as well, and. Um, uh, you know, at one point there, towards the end of Grand Nationals, before they stopped or sort of, you know, became extinct, I guess, um, he, he would run the Grand National and the Sprint car on the same night. Amazing. And, uh, which, you know, when you're a you know, nine or ten year old, yeah. it was, um, or any time really, when you're a 45 year old, that was pretty <laughs> cool. And uh, he was doing Tony Stewart things before Tony Stewart, you know, which yeah. I thought was, um, was pretty v- mega. So. Uh, very cool. Take people on a little bit of a journey there, mate. Who were some of the drivers you were around then? Maybe some of the Americans that came to visit that you were enamoured with and so on. Because you've got this great appreciation for uh, American oval track racing, the participants, the community, the history. You you love that, mate, don't you? Yeah, it's um, and, you know, uh, obviously from our upbringing and being around it every weekend and the, um, the, the, there used to be always a USA sedan team that you'd remember from the Liverpool days um, would come to Australia. There'd be generally there was four of them. That changed a little bit from year to year on who they were, but um, and they would tour around the country and come to Tasmania and so on, and um, which was really really cool. And uh, the one guy that that stands out that become a lifelong friend was um, Jack Hewitt. Yep. And he came out racing. Uh, sedans initially in the late 70s and then uh, later on come out in sprint cars and you know as you know jack races everything and yeah. it was good in everything and um uh so yeah that come and you know sometimes stay and definitely go and hang out with them a lot and um uh yeah they were you know jack was a uh, still is my hero but he was my hero from 
A little Since age. Little, yeah. There's a great book called Hewitt's Law that people can go and find, a Speedway book, which is yeah. tremendous because it's just like you, you get this um, uh, clear understanding of what he's like as a, as a human mate and you like that that style. He's a no-nonsense kind of... Yeah, straight to the point. Straight what to the you point. see is what you get. Mm. He's the same all the time. time. And yeah. He doesn't put it on for the TV or anything. He doesn't... Um, uh, you know, there's Bung plenty on a show. Of, yeah. No, there, and there's plenty to. You can go on YouTube and find some pretty funny interviews with Jack. And, <laughs> um, worth doing for sure. Amazing that that he's ended up for you and for your dad. I mean, he came to a milestone birthday for your dad all the way to Tasmania and stuff. He's he's been a good friend, hasn't he? Yeah, he has. He's um, yeah. There's not many uh, not many people like Hewitt. That's for sure. sure. Him and yeah. Jody, and um, they're just great people and. Uh, yeah, he's um, he, he go he, he's got to go down as one of the best race car drivers mm. in history, and mm. what he what he did at Eldora at the Four Crown, and yep. um, you know running the Indy Five Hundred and all those things he's done, it's it's um, pretty mega. Considering the upbringing that he had and where he came yeah, from, mate, it's a great nothing. it's a great yeah. story. It is a great yeah. story. People can go off and find that. Just quickly, domestically, you the family have a great association with Gary Rush, for example. You know, on the domestic speedway scene too, there's some close ties, isn't there? Yeah, there is, and um, uh, same same thing. Gary's been a, a good friend for a long time, and um, uh, obviously, Dad's known Gary too for for a long time through speedway and. Um, I was working a lot in Sydney, actually, and and and. When, how uh, old were you here? Tell me what were you doing. Oh, it's not that long ago. It's only it was probably, um, what are we now? Probably f- oh, thirteen or fourteen years ago. I was um, doing a lot of work in Sydney, travelling a lot in Sydney to Sydney, and uh, uh, for work. And um, often I'd go and stay with Gary, and we'd go to Outback Steakhouse, and and um, and I'd just get him to tell me old racing stories. Stories, yeah. Um, they are the knows. best. They are the best. Those nights, mate, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Mm. he's he's got a book coming out, which uh, which is going to be awesome. But um, some of the stories from America in the early days, when he um, uh, the stuff he did over there, that a lot of people here don't even no. know about. Mm. It was um, so yeah, I'd get him to. Uh, I could just sit there and listen all night to all that sort of stuff. Stories, yeah. Um, as you know, you know Gary's um, our version of Steve Kinzer, isn't he? Exactly, exactly. Hey, we're darting all over the place here, but the theme I want to come back to is your dad's car for a moment, if I can. You and your brother, Christian, tracked that thing down and restored it for him for his 70th, I think, wasn't it, that you did yep. it for. Tell me where you found it, what state it was in, and <clears throat> I, I gather the peer of you have restored it, period, correct, haven't you? Yeah, so we. it was... Um, I was only a minute part of it because it was all in Tassie and Christian did um, did most of it with, with some help from Steve Reynolds that used to work on it. Awesome. And um, the car was actually sold to um, a guy by the name of Alan Jones, not the Alan Jones, Jones but yeah. Alan Jones in um, Ballarat. And he ran it on the Thunderdome when they were running late models on the Thunderdome, which... Um, uh, when you look at those cars now, it was a pretty um, pretty sketchy exercise. <laughs> <laughs> so they, were, they were going around three seconds, I think, faster than a NASCAR around Holy. there. So, yeah. And certainly not built to crash at those speeds. But, mm. um, but that's what they were doing. Though. And so he hadn't um, changed the car much. They had to put a windshield in them and a few things like that. But he finished with it and it was in a paddock under a tree. Unbelievable. And, uh, yeah, so original um, paint, that the way Dad ran it on the chassis and everything, that yep. was all still there. Um, obviously, that all got redone, but, um, yeah, Christian managed to um, get that done right under his nose yep. um, in Devonport. What, what were you two doing double stories about, don't, you know, to send him off, the, yeah, put him yeah. off the scent? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you seen Christian? No, no, I don't. Yeah. I'm not sure where he is. Yeah. Out of service. Yeah. Yeah. But... Um, uh, he was uh, he was getting that done un- under the cover of darkness, basically, and we got an engine. Um, Wayne Mankin um, used to do his engines, and um, so we got an engine. It was in Melbourne, so to to keep it all as authentic as possible, possible yeah. uh, I got Mank to um, look over that engine. We took it over to Gene Cooks and put it on the dyno, and. Um, so it had Manx fingerprints on it, basically, on it. Yeah. for uh, before it went in the car and keep it all. But it's yeah, so it's there in his collection and um, exactly how basically how they used to run it. Awesome. I think um, he's a proud man, but I think he, you you 
nearly got a tear in his eye that night when it came up the driveway, which is amazing. We'll get to Mank too because he's been a mentor and you've crossed paths with him during your career on, uh, and still do to this day on, on more than one occasion. Um, can we, mate, just um, go with, because you, you've mentioned Thunderdome, right? Like legendary place. It's down the road, whatever it is, half an hour's drive from where we're sitting now to, to have this discussion. Kind of a real shame that it isn't being used the, the way that, that um, Bob would have intended. But you got to, in your mid-teens, drive a NASCAR for the first time. What was that like? <coughs> and tell me about it. <laughs> Well, I've got to correct you because I don't think I drove it. It, it definitely <laughs> drove me. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. But um, uh, So Dad had a, had a small part in, in a team with a bunch of guys and Gene Cook looked over, ran this car and drove it. And yep. um, he obviously raced against Gene a lot, you know, through his career, career and yep. from, t- from home as well. And um, so I got to be involved in the pit crew there. I was the catch can guy on, on pit road. Which I can tell you when you're 15, 14, 15 was pretty sketchy when there's no pit road <laughs> speed limit. <laughs> it's like a scene out of Days of Thunder kind of thing. Yeah, isn't? yeah, standing there with your back to these things, ripping past you, waiting for the fuel to come out the back and cover you. But um, uh, yeah, I got to, uh, they're, they're practicing one day and um, uh, Gene stuck me in. I, was fif- I remember I was 15 and. Um, I can't remember how many laps I did, but um, yeah, it was pretty uh, pretty awesome experience. Mm. How how in where you would ultimately go to the states and things? How pivotal was that that moment, mate? Yeah, I was already um, hooked. Mm. I was already hooked on NASCAR because generally in our houses, um, even well before that, there'd be stock car racing magazine laying around. Yeah. So you're reading about Dale Earnhardt and um, Richard Petty and these guys and um and back back then in the 80s particularly they only ever showed the daytona 500 on tv mm-hmm. you didn't get the rest of them there was yep. no fox or anything like that and um so i religiously used to see that race and then the rest of the year you, you know all i had to rely on was stock car racing, racing. magazine were and you cover to cover on that would you read oh, it yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah. um later on when i got to go over there and race it was one of the things that um used to baffle those guys was my knowledge of 80s and 90s NASCAR, NASCAR. stuff mm. and uh, naming who was driving what and what sponsor and, you know, mm. just from from my interest. And it wasn't, not, not that I didn't appreciate it or, or think that they were legends, but I didn't grow up necessarily a Peter Brock or Dick Johnson or a touring car. Mm. It was all about NASCAR. Okay. And that just to me was so much cooler mm. on these big banked ovals and then... Um, you know that early '90s, like Days of Thunder had come out. That really exposed NASCAR to a, to to everybody, and um, that was a real it sounds cliche, but that was a real um, driver for you, driver yeah. for me as well. Mm. That uh, although it's ho- Hollywood <clears throat> sort of sort of driven, it it, it uh, the the, the spin off from that, the enthusiasm yeah, well, from that. And was when that, you yeah. learn about it, all mm. the stories storylines were all real stories of Tim Richmond, yep. um, Rick Hendrick, you know, uh, Harry Hyde was, and they're all real people doing real things, things. and mm. that's how they strung all that together. And um, you know, Dale Earnhardt and Jeff Bodine and their rivalry, and that was all all those storylines filtered um, through it, didn't it? Mm. Came mm. out in the movie, mm. and mm. and. Uh, yeah, so that was a real. All those things were real drivers. So certainly, then the Thunderdome getting going and being able to actually go and drive one of those cars and just the, just the noise of them mm. was, um, uh, yeah, certainly a, um, that stuck with me. Awesome. You got to drive it again at, at some point too. Can we just go to? I'm glad you've you've brought up Tim Richmond here because in your your thirst for knowledge around. Uh, NASCAR and understanding the people and and uh, all of that I mean, it's not homework because it's a labour of love right you enjoy doing it that would help you when you went to the states ultimately but but the thing with Tim Richmond is who's very sadly gone and and, and left us now um, you have been a very big fan of his mate haven't you and chased memorabilia and and you may have even met his sister I think at one point is that right yeah so yeah. He, um it's a funny story. Um, I think I'd been. I think I'd already moved back to Australia, but I was back in Charlotte, and there was a a particular um, museum in Mooresville, and 
they used to change it up in there and I knew the people and I'd just go in and check out what, what they're, anything different, you know, and you could historically have never been able to get any Tim Richmond stuff. It's been no helmets, no fire suits, nothing. And um, one day I walked in there and here's a Tim Richmond fire suit in a glass case. And I said, oh, where did this come from? You can't get any Tim Richmond stuff anywhere. Well, mm. Where's this come from? And they said, oh, his sister, Sandy, um, she just lives up the road at Troutman, which was, you know, 15 minutes up the road. Um, she's the only one left in the family and um, getting into later stages of life, you know, mm. and just she's got all this stuff. And decided mm. that it's time to unbox this stuff and I'm going to wow. start... Um, selling it to you know the the right places and where this will get displayed and um looked after looked after and mm. to keep tim's legacy alive mm. and uh and then she said oh, i've got a number here if you want to ring her <laughs> and, I was, and i thought oh, i don't know about that you know and uh, i said oh well yeah let's uh and she she rang her and, and and sandy said oh yeah just um just send him up to the house i couldn't believe it so <laughs> So I went up there and um, and she literally uh, she's by herself. So she's just moved into this house and um, you know, uh, respectfully older lady, you know. Yes. And so, do you need a hand with something? Do you want, can I move some boxes? And, mm. I, and so here I'm. I think I spent the first couple of hours changing light bulbs and, <laughs> and shifting a bit of furniture around. And, and uh, we we're talking about Tim and all the all the different stories and things and. Um, and then she said, oh, you might as well help me un- unpack some of these boxes. And she told me that um, when Tim passed away, his mum and dad moved into his lake house on Lake Norman and uh, they didn't touch a thing. They boxed up all his stuff mm-hmm. and didn't touch anything. His boots were at the door, his hat's on the hat stand. Wow. And basically um, left it. And she's got all these boxes and they hadn't been opened since then. So we're talking 1989. Yeah. And... And I said, oh, no, you know, that's, that's not you, really... You didn't feel right, is yeah, that what you're saying? Yeah, that, mm. that's not really something I should... Um, that's, that's a family thing, you know, that it didn't feel quite right about. It. Said, oh, no, well, I mean, it's only me and um, I'd, I'd appreciate the help, you know. And don't worry about that. You can just give me a hand if you can. And I said, oh, well, okay. And it was unbelievable because you're literally unboxing Tim Richmond's house from 1989. Nine. And, and you were a big fan, mate. Mm. Yeah, mm. and uh, so... And it was good because there were some things in there um, where, she, you know, she's like, oh, what do you think this is worth? Hmm. I was thinking $150 and I'm like, no, nah, that's $400 all day. Hmm. And uh, some things were the other way, you know, but hmm. it was it was good to give her a hand and what have you. And um, uh, and I've stayed in touch with her. And, Lovely. Um, yeah, it was, it was a pretty cool moment. So hey. we got some good um, good memorabilia that I, that I bought off her and... Hmm. Like Tim's, his first Winston Cup win at Riverside in 82. I've got the 76 flag awesome. from that race. Yeah. Awesome. Take people on a little bit of a journey here, mate, that don't necessarily know him about about Tim Richmond. You talked about him being a, a figure in the storyline of, of Days of Thunder before. He was a um, bit of a character, well-liked, um, had... Had I think if I'm right here, mate, there's a there's a bit of a, a uh, like an Indy 500 sort of story and all sorts, isn't, isn't there in his career? Yeah, so he came up, um, born in Ohio, right in sprint car territory, you know, non-wing sprint car stuff. Um, so he um, he went USAC racing in sprint cars and dirt track for a while, and then uh, quickly landed in a in an Indy car. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was 1980. Um, He'd run out of fuel near the end of the race and Johnny Rutherford won and gave him a ride back on the side pod. There's a bit of cool footage yeah. from that in the Penzoil car. Um, he, um, and then he had, a, he had a bad crash at, uh, I think it was Michigan, and uh, Sandy said, his sister told me that mum said, um, said to dad, that's it. Really? You get him out of that race car or we're getting divorced. Because <laughs> <And so, laughs> it, uh, it was pretty bad. It had tore the car in half and no wheels left. And, you okay. know, and uh, he was pretty lucky, mm. and particularly back then. Mm. Um, so that's when they went, went into NASCAR. And he just had this unbelievable natural talent. Mm. And uh, he was the only guy that could take on Dale Earnhardt. And 
he really had Earnhardt's respect. You know, okay. Earnhardt could intimidate anybody. Yeah. Except Tim Richmond. Yeah. And so a lot of those stories in, uh, so in the, the Days of Thunder movie. Yeah. Um, the tires are half as wide and the yeah, car weighs. All of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that all, all that stuff happened. The coming down pit lane in reverse because he <laughs> busted the gearbox and they stuck it in fourth. And it, that happened to Pocono for real. You know, Amazing. he couldn't couldn't get a gear except reverse so he just reversed it around and back down pit lane and yeah um respect respect to don simpson and jerry bruckheimer for getting that level of of yeah. uh, 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 connection rather than just writing some bs story well, it line, was you know? it was more tom cruise because he he'd been doing a bit of imsa racing and um become buddies with rick hendrick and then they'd go testing with the nascar and tom would jump in and do some laps and just for fun you know and um so him and Rick were friends, and then uh, he said, "We're going to make a movie about this." Awesome! And then all because he's hearing all these stories, stories. about mm. what Tim did and um, Earnhardt and all those different things, and um, obviously a bit of Hollywood got put around some of those things, things. but yeah. the the crux of those stories were were a real, you know, were the real thing. Amazing. Come back to your own career now. Let, let's we, we've talked about the. Um, Two tunes, thirty-five bucks. <laughs> your uh, your Victor engine. Um, I think is that right, mate? The, the <clears> first <throat> race may have been is it, is it High Clear up around yeah, Burnie Way? Yeah, and Burnie. Yeah. yeah. What was it, what were your first? Maybe you're too young, mate. But 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 <laughs> can, can, did it have you know racing racing carts back then? We like, man, this is me. This is what I want to do. Well, I was shitting my pants and I was trying <laughs> to get out of it when we got there. So, I think. Um, I think Dad said something along the lines of, "We're doing it today, or we're not coming back." You know, really, it was yeah. something along those lines. To yeah. uh, it was like, "All oh, right, I guess we are doing, doing it." Then. It, <laughs> it, it got pretty real as you come over the railway lines into into the gate into Highclere and yeah. and uh, all the noise and smoke and the smell and you know, um, I suppose those things are you know pretty intimidating when you're an eight year old. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but yeah, it was. I do remember that that. Um, I was uh, I was pretty keen not to do it at the very <laughs> beginning, but that went away at some point, thankfully. Yep. How the how the hats changed. Now you're walking that road with your son <laughs> yeah, Hudson, yeah, aren't yeah, you? He's yeah. literally just started a little yeah. bit a little bit of karting. Lex Rick Kelly's son is doing some stuff too. Oh, that's happening, isn't it? So yeah, yeah, it is. It's um and it's great fun. It's I said to said to Rick the other day. I said this is way better than any of the racing we ever did. Really, it's way more fun yeah. going and watching those two go around and. Mm. And um, and learning and Hudson's only just turned seven, but so he's just practicing. We haven't gone racing or anything yet, but um, yeah, we're just getting laps on him and just see how he goes. If he wants to keep doing it, we'll keep doing it and mm. see what happens. I'm, I'm going to um, inject a little bit of information here um, from mum and dad because I know you probably won't, so I'm going to do it for you. Uh, y- your dad talked to me about the, the whole notion of sons of rich and famous fathers right very early on in your time as a young fella you you had a quite a frank conversation with him around the whole notion of if we have to bankroll this the whole way i'm out i'm not interested didn't you Mm. i'd seen um some people we'd known through karting and what have you along the way that you see some people um just writing the check for everything yep and even the guys that have got talent, when when it's, um, I feel like the industry starts to know, and just expects that dad to keep writing a check. Check, mm. and that's what. And despite it doesn't matter how good that kid is, they just keep getting him to write a check. And if you're trying to become a professional, it's not about the money as such, as in making the money. It's if you want to become a professional. Um, that means getting paid to do it, right? Mm-hmm. And we'd all do it for free, mm. despite what they tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but but setting the tone around setting ar- the tone, mm. knowing, uh, getting paid your worth, mm-hmm. and knowing where where you sit on which side of the fence. And it was very clear to me early on that um, <clears throat> there's a fence there, and you're on one side or the other. Mm. You're paying, or you're getting paid. Paid, yeah. And it, it, I know which side I want to be on. <laughs> yeah. And and it, like I say, that wasn't about the actual money in the end it's mm. it's about um being on the correct side of the fence and uh and being um you know uh um the, the respect out the, of that yeah. in, in the in the paddock that, that yeah. you get from from uh from that and, and the mm. setting the setting the tone is is um 
a number of ways because it's also benefiting you because you have this ethic, mate, this work ethic of, of the way you hustled in America, the way you chased stuff here. Uh, I mean, you know, just writing the ticket wasn't your way. You just didn't want to do that, did you? No, and... Um, and I might add, he wasn't. Um, Chaz didn't have his checkbook out flapping it around <laughs> under my nose either. So. <laughs> he says he says maybe a little bit of help in Formula Ford and some he, tyres he did, here and there, and that's about yeah, it basically. He did, yeah, yeah, he did help in the start of the, get the Formula Ford thing going. Hmm. Um, you you got to get going somehow. Somehow, yeah. but um, uh, but yeah, it wasn't. Um, you know, the one it wasn't really an option to just write a check anyway, but. Hmm. Um, but in my mind, it was, well, if you can't get there on merit, mm. then you shouldn't be there. Be there, yeah. This is a special three-part episode and is only just getting started. I'll be here the whole way, but let's get back to Rusty for an emotion-filled part of the conversation. Can we talk, mate, I, I, in, in bouncing around ideas for this discussion, um, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a difficult one, but we both agree we, we need to cover it, and that, that is the accident you had at, at Phillip Island as a, as a young fella, right? I want you to, if you're comfortable, go back there. Tell us what happened that day. Um, your mum tells me she was super nervous, mate, because when you woke up, you were, you know, I still want to do this. What happened that day? Sorry. <laughs> right. 96. Yep. Yeah, 96. So <clears throat> it was, um, I was, I was lucky to get an opportunity with Paul Little and his Porsche team and with Anthony Tratt and um was that you was, wor- was that you working relationships did you did you go and meet those guys how did you get that opportunity it was i can't remember the very first i knew i can't remember who how we got the ball rolling to be honest so we i knew that uh Paul was stepping out of the seat and they were mm. going to put somebody in it yep. and I can't remember who we made the first contact with, but we managed to get a test at Calder, and uh, they, I think it was myself, Warren Luff, and Gary Walden. Okay. I think, yeah. Yep. Yep. And uh, We're talking Porsche Cup back then too, aren't yeah. we? Because I was a green commentator. They were toll-backed cars. I can, I can remember them. They were yep. pretty, pretty handy, pretty quick things too, weren't yeah, they? they? Yeah, they were. They were mm. serious race cars. Mm. Mm. And... Um, uh, so we, we went and did the test and we um, we ended up with the gig and we went to and I had no idea what I was doing how old were you? 19 19 yep. and so I hadn't driven anything I'd done uh, obviously the karting and then I did uh, one or two HQ races in Tassie uh-huh. and uh, and then then this and um, so it wasn't that I mean they were pretty fast cars but none of that really the speed and all those things was okay it was mm. and the power of it and all that was all, all all okay it was the um but you know your race craft and all the uh, still you're still learning all those mm. things aren't you mm. as, as you do mm. so we went to winton and um uh on it was the last race of the old track before the extension mm. um and had a good race there, uh, and we ran fourth. Had a good race with um, uh, Lucio Cesario. Oh, yeah, Cesario. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, I do. So, you know, and they said he was pretty handy. I didn't know him personally, but I um, uh, thought this is going all right. Mm-hmm. And the next race was Phillip Island. Um, and then, uh, so we went to Phillip Island and... Um, I think it was the second race. I can't remember exactly, but um, went down into Honda, out of Honda into Siberia, and sort of memories a bit fuzzy from there. But mm-hmm. um, about where it stops. But I remember being hit in the left door, mm-hmm. and I honestly can't remember whether I was on the outside, whether you know if someone's. 
I don't know. Mm. I don't know exactly what's happened, but we've gone off. Uh, and you, you look at it now and go, it's not that fast. That part of the track's certainly on that place. It's not one of the faster places. But the way we've hit, um, I've gone off the road fairly, you know, Decently. Fairly decent. And it's gone in backwards and it was Phillip Island's a lot better now, but it was just earth filled mm-hmm. tires and um you know, there wasn't a lot of give there. Mm. And this is before wraparound seats and yep. all those things. Yep. Um Hans, all the yeah, stuff yeah, was yeah. as good as what it was in the day, but um but it was pre all that. And then uh so I've gone in backwards, the cab that that was in it with me, he went in frontwards. Um my uh, coming back to Jack Hewitt, I actually had a, a Simpson helmet on that Jack Hewitt had sent over from a birthday that Dad organised. Wow! And uh, it, Hewitt had had it painted, and I kept that paint scheme right through my career. Excellent. And um, um, so I was lucky; I was wearing a good helmet, hmm. and uh, I've hit the my head's hit the roll cage next to the seat. Mm-hmm just straight on the bare cage and that and then they say and then you come forward and you've hit the steering wheel as well on the on the rebound i guess and um obviously i don't remember any of that but um next thing i remember is just going going through the the doors at the alfred hospital after the helicopter ride mm-hmm. um and uh waking up there and not knowing what had happened or mm. you know and uh mum and dad's I've spoken to them about this. So your mum says one of the first things you asked about was the helmet because Jack had given you that and cutting your dad's race suit. You're in your dad's race suit too, weren't you? That's all right. Yeah, and it was... Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I couldn't believe they cut his suit off. <laughs> but, he, said, um, he said that's the last thing he was worried about. But you were worried about it and you were worried about the helmet, weren't you? Yeah, it was, um, and you don't know, you know, I was in, I was in this neck brace, I remember this neck brace up under your chin here that mm. obviously keeps your, your neck and spine and, or, you know, keeping it all, all lined up, because they initially had thought it broke broken my back and my neck, and they didn't know, obviously, at that point, so you're in all these braces, and, and the, the pain up under the chin had this a headache that I can't even, I can't even imagine it now. Really? And... From the brace, from the brace. No, and the, 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 the headache the, was... The, from the pain. From the, yeah, the fractured skull and yep. several other things. And um, that was... Uh, <clears throat> I remember, um, yeah, asking what happened. They said, oh, you're in a crash. And, yeah, from there it was... The next few days were... All of that got worse, cause I guess the... Um, you know, brain swelling and yep. all these things, but um, yeah, I couldn't um, couldn't even stand somebody walking in the room. The noise of somebody just just walking in the room was too much. Wow, with um, with this headache mm. and this yeah, uh, obviously with this you know fractured skull and what have you, and um, uh, yeah, it was. Um, I had some nerve damage to an eye and. My, my left eyelid was shut. Mm. They weren't sure if it was going to open again, were they? Yeah. Or open properly anyway. Yeah, mm. and that was um, uh, that was that was a concern. And then, um, well, first of all, it was just you know you just wanted to um, if you lay down long enough, all you want to do is get out of bed. Mm. You know? mm. And um, uh, the um, so initially in the Alfred there was. Uh, I wasn't supposed to get up, but eventually after, I can't remember how long it was, but after a couple of days, I'm like, right, I'm going to the toilet to take a slash. (laughs) I don't care what anyone says. He's sick of this, you know, peeing in the bucket in the bed and all that stuff that you got to do. But I got up and um, had all these balance issues and all all this, um, your your inner ear was knocked around, which is all your balance and all these things. and. Immediately hit the deck and uh, still got to the toilet and got that done. That was that mission was, accomplished. Uh, yeah. yeah, that was a, a big relief in more ways than one, you know. Uh-huh. And um, and then then it was a matter of um, 
uh, a rehab hospital and um, yeah well and then it was you know in my mind it was just a matter of, I just want to get out of this hospital mm. you just want to get as far away from it as you can, can. the whole thing mm. you don't want to talk mm. about it you don't want to think about it you just mm. want to get away from it and because nobody plans that do they no and uh you know, you've got this plan in your head. Are you going to be a race car driver? And this is how you're going to do it. And you're mm. going to do all these things. And um, you don't see that coming. Mm. And uh, Anthony Tratt is good mates with Glenn Seaton. Yep. And Tratt, he was obviously in the other car and um, on the day. And um, he brought Glenn into the hospital. Mm-hmm. And You're right. It's okay, mate. You're right. You don't often talk about this, mate. You, I, 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 you've been good enough to open up on it in the podcast, but I know as a rule you have fundamentally compartmentalised this and moved on. So this is uh, this is a bit raw. So anyway, he brought Glenn into the hospital. Yeah. Yeah, which was that was a big big boost for me. You know, mm. it was that someone of that stature would come in, come in and mm. and see me. And um, <clears throat> and prior to this, even when I was in carts, John Bow was. Um, as a Tasmanian, as a as a respected racer and Australian touring yeah, car champion, yeah, he yeah. was a he he was um, as big a help to me as anybody. Mm-hmm. And um, he used to be, I, I'm sure I used to pester him to death because <laughs> I, I did my apprenticeship only about a kilometre up the road from his dad's BMW dealership, and he had this office with a big glass window, so he couldn't escape me. <laughs> but I knew he was there, and I would go in there, and he would he would most times be on the phone politicking about splitter lengths or something for <laughs> Ford <laughs> which he was very good at, good at. Yeah. and uh, just listening to those conversations were um, eye opening <laughs> were eye opening and, and good learning but he rang me in the hospital and said well, he actually asked me he said well, are you going to keep racing and I said well, and at that point whatever day that was I, I hadn't actually thought about it mm. You know, all this other stuff going on. And I said, I haven't even given it a thought. And he said, well, I think you should. I think Excellent. you can do it. He yep. was at Winton when we and, and at Phillip Island, actually. Yep. And um, he said, I think you should. Mm. And so that was it. That was mine made up on that then. Mm. And then it was a matter of um, getting everything fixed Mm. so that I could go and jump back in something to see if I still had it or had the nerve or was Mm. it going to scare the daylights out of you you just Mm. don't know do you and so they actually um, surprisingly they rebuilt that car and then um, it was about uh, it was about a year later I guess might have been 10 months but uh, or it might have been 18 months I'd have to go back and have a look but Mm. I know it took about a year for for everything to come right with with my, with what I had going on, and so my eyelid started fixing itself. Excellent. But then I had some um, some toe issues, <laughs> and uh, I had to. Were you wandering left to or yeah, something or other? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, blue eyes, one blue, one mine, one blue, the other. Okay, okay. Uh, no, so my left eye was um, uh, was uh, out of whack, so I did get that right and um but that caused um a whole bunch of double vision and so on so i was running the pirate patch mm-hmm. for i don't know probably six months wow. and uh until once it started to open see and you mm-hmm. know i could see out of it mm-hmm. and then um all of that thankfully and they can't the biggest frustration is they can't tell you mm-hmm. whether a nerve's going to fix itself or not it's yeah. just literally a waiting game and you're not that patient when you're 19 mm. and uh, and on a mission. And so all of that stuff um, came good. And then, uh, they yeah, so we went to Calder and they said, do you want to, um, we, we've got the car fixed, do you want to come and have a drive? And so we went, I went and did that and um, drove it and it was, it felt like I was doing it yesterday and everything just felt normal. Mm. I thought, oh, well, mm. keep going then. A couple to, to wrap this up. Firstly, uh, in the wake of that John Bauer conversation, at some point you must have spoken to your um, to your mum, and and she was like, "Really, we're, we're gonna we're gonna keep doing this kind of thing." Did you, for them, contemplate stopping, or was it once Bowie had said that you were mine made up? 
No, I am. Um, well, see, I've never. I never. Uh, they they asked me in the hospital. They're trying to work out how bad I was, and they said um, the doctor said, "Oh, um, who won the grand final or who won the football or something?" Mm-hmm. And and I said, "I think I said fuck the final." <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Dad said. Yeah, you might want to ask him something else because he wouldn't know that wouldn't have known that last week either. Oh, so, no, okay, okay. I, I'm not into football. Ball. I'm not into mm. anything else but racing cars, and I've never been in anything else. And there's and there is nothing else for me. So there was never a doubt. You know, I couldn't even start to think about what else I might do because mm. there isn't anything else. Mm. And uh, so I, I actually remember being in the. Um, I was going to a doctor's appointment with Dad. I must have been out of the rehab hospital, but we were, I think we are an outpatient at this point. Mm-hmm. And we're in Richmond somewhere having to go to... Um, and he was sort of on the... Um, I was trying to get my licence back, my CAMS licence back. So, you know, obviously you've got to be fit and healthy and, and Proof, so on. And yeah. I think I might have been going for a medical. I'm not sure. I remember he said something like... Um, I don't remember exactly what he said, but it was along the lines of, you know, at least you're, at least you're still alive. You're still walking. You're not. Mm. You haven't got a broken neck. Something like that. You know, mm. that, which is true. Yeah, hundred percent. But nineteen-year-old me was. Um, I remember I got quite upset, and I'm like, I don't care about any of that. I just want my license back. So until I had my racing license, I wasn't normal. 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 Mm. It's exactly that's the word. I wasn't normal. Mm. And this eye patch and all these things that mm. you got going on, and just want to be normal. And normal to me was having a racing, racing license. license. Back. Your mum says that um, with the whole uncertainty around the eye and what it might do, you very determinedly said, "Well, I don't care if it doesn't come right. I don't care. I'll go and do what." Jack Hewitt's father did. Was it Jack Hewitt's father that had an eye issue and he still went and did some... Or it was, Jack, might, was Jack it Jack? Himself, was it Jack yeah. himself. Wow, sorry, beg your pardon. Yeah, no, yeah. I was about to bring that up that um, I can't tell you how much of an inspiration Jack and Ernie Irvin mm-hmm. in NASCAR at, at just a couple of years before Ernie had a really bad wreck at Michigan mm-hmm. and he was racing with an eye patch. They probably wouldn't let him now. Mm. But, he but went back out, then, yeah, back yeah. then, he's racing with an eye patch, and well, if they um, can do it, yeah. well, and, and Hewitt had a, a torsion bar go through his visor and and just missed his eye, and um, did you know had quite a few stitches and so on, and um, broke his eye socket, I think, and but there he was the next week at the track with an eye patch, and still racing. So, yeah. um, so that meant. So I had this feeling of, well, I'm like Ernie Irvin, and but, but more so Jack Hewitt, mm. and um, that that was a you didn't feel like you're all alone this um, in this process of, of yeah. could, could I go racing and mm, yeah mm, yeah mm. so it was um, I thought well if they can do it then mm. to finish this thing here just to underscore how close you came, mate. Greg Hansford's gone now. A lot of work went on with safety around that joint after he left. You did benefit from that, didn't you? Yeah, so um, I wasn't fortunate enough to to meet Greg Hansford, but after what happened to him at Phillip Island, they, they upgraded their medical equipment at the track and... Um, one of the doctors told Dad that um, I was lucky that day because they had the right stuff. Mm. And they had the right stuff because of what happened to Greg, Greg. Hansford. Mm. Mm. You were... How close are we talking, mate? One of them suggested 30 seconds. Far That's out. Probably as close as you want to get. get. Yeah, don't want to get any closer than that. Let's close that chapter, mate. I don't recommend it. No, I don't. (laughs) That's you to a T. Can we unlock your memory about the first time you got the opportunity to drive a supercar? Where were you? How did that come about? How did you make that happen? Um, 
We've just had some more beers arrive. <laughs> that is much needed. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Well timed. Well timed. Should we state that it's not 9 a.m., Greg? No, it's not 9 a.m. <laughs> it's 4.30 in the afternoon. Yeah. Keep going. We're, we're due this. Yeah. Um, it was at Calder, and so that crash happened at Phillip Island in 96. It basically wiped me out for all of 97. Yep. 98, we got organised to um, run a Formula Ford with Simon Hardwich. And um, he was running a, a Formula Holden for Scott Dixon mm-hmm. and um, that year. And, and 97 was the first year of the Holden Young Lions. And uh, HRT ran that program and they were really serious about it and, ran, and everyone remembers Bugs putting it on pole at Bathurst and then what happened in the warm-up, etc. But... Um, and and HRT at the time were um, the dominant outfit. Outfit, yeah. that, yeah. and um, uh, John Bow um, pestered. Uh, well, not pestered. Uh, had a word to I, I was the pest. Uh, John <laughs> Bow had a word to Jeff Gretch and said, "You uh, for the following year, they were doing it a bit different. They farmed it out to Gibson Motorsport, but um, it was still within HRT, and they were going to take on." Um, it went from four drivers to two. And um, I reckon I rang Jeff Gretsch 120 times. <laughs> uh, how he didn't, if he could have blocked my number, then he would have. But um, I'm sure he was fobbing me off, but I just did not. Relent, let up unrelenting. Until he mm. took my call and, uh, and had the correct answer. <laughs> and then we. Um, I look back on it now and think, what a, what a pain in the ass I must have been. Because <laughs> I literally would ring him five, six times a week and, um, to so, get on that program. Yep. And uh, with, with JB's help, um, that happened. And so the first test uh, was, so it was in, I drove Scaife's VS. Far out. Yeah, and which... And the, I look back at it now and I sort of kicked myself because I went there going, you've got to remember, putting young blokes in supercars in 98 was only a new thing. So, yeah, you know, they tried it with McConville in 93. He had that crash at, at Bathurst. Bathurst. Yeah. Um, and then... So people are gun-shy in the pit lane again, are they? Yeah. Mm-hmm. and that, Well, you know, it probably didn't... Nothing against Cam. He went on to do awesome things, mm. but... Um, and then it was the lounge factor that got the ball rolling again. They'd been, and back then there's no testing rules, and um, so they're at Calder every Wednesday with lounge is wearing the place out. Yeah, and with the gazillion Bridgestone tyres. Yeah, <laughs> all, all of that. And, uh, uh, you know, then the Young Lions thing in 97 was the next lot. And so it was still early days, and, and try, there was no development series. So trying to get laps in a supercar was incredibly difficult for anybody that wasn't in one full time. And getting used to that H pattern gearbox and that Hollinger box, you know, it was pretty tricky for for new blokes. Um, and I went there going, right, I'm not going to be a young hothead and do something silly. I'll just show how um, um, professional, professional I am and, and, yeah. and sensible I am. Hmm. And I think I could have driven it, gone a bit harder, you know. Okay. And but you don't know what you what to expect. But I remember. I remember it, you know, at Calder, and it was, um, yeah, obviously an eye opener, like plenty of grunt. It was certainly the most grunt I'd experienced. Okay. And um, uh, but I just rocked up there by myself, and you know they just throw you in and don't really tell you anything. <laughs> just go and drive the car, and <laughs> okay, you know, and just um, and it all that all went good. I don't think um, they weren't as serious about the young lions thing then as they were the year before, but. It was Todd Kelly and myself. So, um, uh, but yeah, that was to you know to come into it and drive um, one of the best, if not the best, car out there at the time in your first go was um, was an eye opener. Fast forward in life, you and Todd are good mates now, yeah, and, yeah, and, and, and Rick uh, as well. Did that give you, um, given everything that we've just spoken about, a sense of right? I'm kind of back. I'm, I'm, you know. Yeah. Validation, you know. Yeah, yeah. it did. Um, I'd say by then I was. Um, it was still, all of this was still pretty fresh. I'm only a couple of years removed from Phillip Island, and it was. It really wasn't 
uh, I was eyes forward. Don't want to think about that. Don't yep. want to talk about it. Don't even bring it up. Don't yep. even want to know, know about, about it. it. Yeah, it didn't even happen in my mind. And I don't know if that's a way. What would have you know? Smarter people than me probably say, "Well, that's how you deal with it," or uh, a way of dealing with it, or something. But um, it wasn't until it sort of I think it was two thousand we won there in the Australian Formula Ford Championship, and that really like right, I've beat you now, and. That was probably the uh, the bigger turning point as far as Philip Island went, but um, but certainly those the young line stuff and being around HRT at the time, it was just eyes forward. Mm. The the stuff with Bowie in your corner that you described before and and things like that, that stuff's really important, mate, in the in the grand scheme of things because you're in your mind, your your eyes forward away away you go. But it's a brutal game, mate. And some people can look at you like damaged goods. You know, you've seen that with others in Formula One and all sorts of and all sorts of things. So, mm. knowing what you're like, that that uh, a that you could get in with the Holden Young Lions and and cut some really solid laps and impress, and then that you had people like Bowie in your corner like that. That's important, isn't it? Yeah, no, hundred mm. percent. And um, yeah, JB was awesome the whole way through. I remember him. I remember him telling him about it that night about driving Scaife's car and. Um, he should have told me sooner because he said, I said, I think I underdrove it, you know. <laughs> I think I was too sensible. And, um, and he said, he said, right, he said, what you do, you always drive 12 tenths. Oh. And then you come in and you tell them you're only driving seven tenths because you wanted to look after it. <laughs> <laughs> what a great so, piece of advice. <laughs> and I've since then, I use that forever. So, do you? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna give, I've obviously given that one away now, but yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. so awesome. anything you've ever seen was everything I had at the yeah. time, <laughs> despite what I said. Along the way, in that early 2000 phase, you and I would cross paths on several occasions around what uh, was known as um, as development series, Fujitsu series, Super Two, and, and so on. You got to drive for Dick Johnson and things like that, didn't you? Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, it's um. So the development ster- series started in 2000, and then. Uh, uh, which was obviously a great way for people like me to get in a supercar because you're trying to get an enduro ride was the um, the goal the goal yeah. um, initially you know to get laps and and to go testing and um, prior to that you know I would go with um, like the toll team like Paul Little was sponsoring my Formula Ford and um, he actually. Um, he did a huge amount for me because he gave me a job in Melbourne at Toll to, so I could move here and, you know, survive and um, and sponsored my race car as well. So um, he did that for, for several years. And so, yeah, it was the development series in 01. Um, Wayne Mankin, who I mentioned earlier, used to build Dad's engines. And Mank's a, a legend around... Um, around circuit racing and and particularly engine building and um and so on and he's been a real mentor for me for from you know way back then and still is you know and um so he he was good buddies with uh he's good buddies with john faulkner Faulkner. and Mm. um faulkner had just gone from he had the xhrt car the x brock car the vs and he'd just gone into his new vt i guess it would have been Mm. Um, what did you guys call it? Milk Crate Racing or something, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, <laughs> so the deal was I remember standing there with Mank and Faulkner's there um, sucking down a cigarette and um, probably polishing his coffee machine at the same time, which I learnt of him. Um, but the car's sitting there. Ryan McLeod had used it in that first year of um, development, or Conica series. Series it was, yeah. And... He basically said, well, there it is. You can use it. You've got to work on it, transport it, get your own guys. Um, as long as you give it back to me like that. And if you can find a few bucks along the way to give me, then good. Okay. And that was, that was the <laughs> That's deal. That's the deal. <laughs> which is pretty unheard of. And so, of course, I jumped at that. And um, so I actually um, threw Mank, a guy that worked for him, Brian Blackwell, He, we got him on board to and uh to sort of run it on the weekends and then troy russell who's yeah um owns the the audi outfit now and yeah. uh, melbourne performance a, yeah, yeah melbourne performance center um he was in the very early stages of getting that business going and one of his clients had a little rigid truck so we borrowed that and 
we had two milk crates and we used to joke that it was milk crate racing because all we had was two milk crates and there was like a brake rotor, a t- uh, uh, an axle and a tail light. And, and, that was uh, it. <laughs> that was it. And Faulkner said, don't touch anything, don't move the wing, I've done everything and it's back to where, it, where I started. So to save you the trouble, I thought, well, that makes it easy, we've just got to drive it. Drive it, it. yeah. And there was, um, there was four of us. Uh, on the crew, or three crew, myself. Um, obviously, mum and dad would come along, and mum's lamingtons were a hit with those yeah, blokes. They and still are, still yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and that's what we did. And it was, it was. Uh, John was right about the car. It was um, it good was car, a bloody mm, good car. Mm, mm. And but we ran the we ran the crappy brake pads that didn't wear out the rotors. Okay, and then because yeah. I got some sponsorship off Bianti Model Cars and. Um, Trevor Young who's sadly no longer with us but a great supporter of young guys and and a lot of racing and um, uh, but it wasn't a a huge budget but we had to we couldn't be throwing rotors at it and all these different things Things. so we had to Mm. make it all survive Um, but we were up against Gibson Motorsport running a two car outfit and they'd turn up there with 25 people like it was a super caravan and um we managed to win a couple and um, hold our own there, so it was uh, that was a real. Um, we're, I'm still super proud of that because it was literally me and a couple of mates. That's the end of part one of my podcast with Owen Kelly. We're enjoying the chat. Hope you are too. There's lots more to come on those early years of supercars, hustling to meet Dale Earnhardt Jr. and how that would help him make a move to America to pursue a childhood dream of driving in NASCAR. You'll get a sense of life in a beautiful part of the world considered the hub of this sport, doing the hard yards, prepping a car and racing in the ultra-competitive late models, plus the monster car, and another, usually driven by an all-time great, that he secretly cut some laps in. That is a cool story and not widely known. Part two and a third instalment are in the Rusty's Garage Library for you to enjoy right now.